Hello, and welcome to Past, the podcast about those who would never rule. I'm Veronica Fortune, and this week's episode is Charles of Orléans, Part 1. Welcome. Before I even start this episode, I want to bring up something very important. Bias. I know I've mentioned this before, but it's something that I shouldn't ignore. I have plenty of biases, just like any person, and I do try to acknowledge those, including one that will come up in this next series of episodes. But this isn't the bias I'm talking about. I'm not even talking about source bias. No, I'm talking about subject bias. I want the subject of each series to be the main character when I present them. So when covering, say, Richard III, Duke of York, his goals, his point of view, and his side will feature. The other side gets mentioned, but it's never the main focus. With this first subject, Charles of Orléans, this will be odd if you've listened to Richard III, Duke of York, or even Edward, Prince of Wales. Charles is a Frenchman on the French side of the Hundred Years' War, and that stance never changes. He wants his uncle and then his cousin to be king, not any Lancastrian or Yorkist. So while it was probably really clear that I'm a huge fan of Richard III, Duke of York, I'm also a huge fan of Charles of Orléans for completely different reasons. This is also going to explain, just as a reminder, how William de la Pole, first Duke of Suffolk and previously the Earl of Suffolk, was a bit of a villain in Richard III, Duke of York's story, but a bit of a hero in Charles's story. Spoilers, and in case you need a reminder, that's the guy with the shortest banishment ever. If you were a believer in the English right to France through Edward III and Henry V's claims, then Suffolk is a villain. But if you were a believer in the Valois claim to France, then Suffolk is neutral to a hero. So always remember that when listening to any episodes. I should also warn you that this will be the longest subject thus far. Charles, spoilers, lives longer than any past I've covered except Robert Curthouse. And unlike Robert, we know so much more about Charles' childhood, which is where I'll be starting now. Charles of Orléans had a normal childhood, at least for a child whose mother had been banished from Paris, despite his father being the second most powerful man in the city. Okay, he probably didn't have a normal childhood, but how many princes do? At least until his father's death, his childhood was not something to complain about. Charles was the oldest surviving son of Louis Duke of Orléans and his wife, Valentina Visconti. He was their fourth son, though. They had lost two earlier sons, and his older brother would die not long after he was born. Oh, and Charles is related to two other famous Charleses, Charles VI and Charles VII. He was actually named for the former. To keep from confusing these three men, I'll be using regnal names for the two kings, and Charles of Orléans will just be Charles. Not that he could ever just be Charles. Oh, and I'm going to call John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, John or John the Fearless, but his followers will, of course, be Burgundians. There are also a lot of Louis in this episode, and I'll try to keep these straight for you. Most of the princes of the blood will be named for their title. So when a father dies and his son succeeds to that title, I will make notes of this change in the nomenclature and make sure to remind you the first few times I use their new title. This will actually happen twice with the Bourbon title. In case you're curious as to what a Prince of the Blood is, wait for a Wednesday. This too shall pass. We'll explain that to you. One more naming note for you. While the Civil War that will start up in around 1407 is referred to as the Armagnac-Burgundian Civil War. The Armagnac faction would be better referred to as the Orleanist, which is what I'll be doing. The good news is, though, that if you Google Orleans-Burgundian War, it comes up with the Armagnac-Burgundian Civil War. I checked this in multiple browsers. I should probably go back to the beginning since I've already killed off our subject's father. Charles was born on the 24th of November, 1394. I know I mentioned it earlier, but Charles of Orléans was named after his uncle, Charles VI, who was also his godfather, and in a moment of mental health, held the infant at his baptism. At the time of his birth, Charles had one older living brother. Sadly, this brother would die before Charles' first birthday. Valentina and Louis were actually first cousins once removed, 
Yes, yet again, everyone's related, papal dispensation was received. In case you think the name Visconti sounds familiar, you're not wrong. She is the niece of Violant Visconti, the widow of Lionel of Antwerp, the second son of Edward III. Oh yes, everyone really is related. This means that Valentina's father was Gian Galizio Visconti, who was accused of murdering his sister's third husband and may have poisoned Lionel. He had married one of Louis's aunts, and Valentina was their only child to survive to adulthood. Gian had two other children with his second wife. Oh, and yes, names starting with V were rather popular for women in the Visconti family. Louis was the younger son of Charles V of France. And Charles is the often overlooked king who allowed France to begin to recover from the early victories of Edward III in the Hundred Years' War. I'm actually a huge fan of Charles V. Sadly, Charles V's reign was short, only 14 years, the same length as his father's, whose reign had been unimpressive, but dwarfed by the 44-year reign of his son, Charles VI. Louis, Charles's father, wasn't even eight when Charles V died, and he was, in fact, his brother's, Charles VI, heir presumptive for all of about a three-month period until his first nephew was born in 1392. Charles, our subject, was born during an unsure time in the French court. His uncle, Charles VI, had his first mental episode in 1392. I've mentioned this in plenty of earlier episodes. What I didn't know until I started researching for Charles's episodes is the only person who could successfully calm Charles VI during his episodes was Valentina. Remember when I was discussing months ago the John of Gaunt and his brother Edmund of Langley and their issues with their Castilian wives? How I agreed with Helen Carr that they probably would have been better off if they traded wives? Yeah, this is the same thing. Charles VI and Louis of Orleans had the same problem. Remember, there are rumors that Isabeau, Charles VI's wife, and Louis were having an affair. I will point out quickly that both Charles VI and Louis were kind to their respective wives, at least as far as Charles VI could be. But really, each brother got along with the other's wife in a way that might point to them being better suited. Sadly, this was not the time when people got to pick their own partners. It should, in theory, be awesome that Charles VI's sister-in-law could help him. That sounds like a great thing for the kingdom, right? Having a mentally unwell king is never good. Well, apparently, no. Because when Charles VI was ill, his uncles and cousins, especially Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, had more power, and they didn't love the idea of him being well. So how to deal with this? There's always that great old chestnut, witchcraft. Witchcraft! It can be used for anything! Need your nephew's wife out of the way to prevent the possible legitimization of their children? Witchcraft! Need to embarrass the king's mother-in-law and wife? Witchcraft! Need to keep the king from having lucid moments to retain your own power? Witchcraft! Yes, Valentina was accused of witchcraft and sorcery. Oh, and not for making the king better. She was blamed for her illness. The logic was that since she made him better, she must be causing the illness to gain power. Yeah, witchcraft really does make blaming things on women a bit easier. Today, we just have to resort to accusing them of wearing moon bumps and lying about being pregnant. These accusations towards Valentina occurred around a year after Charles' birth, and Valentina was banished from Paris based on these accusations when Charles was 17 months old. Louis, her husband, and theoretically the second most powerful man in Paris, well, did nothing. He allowed his wife to be banished without protest. Part of this was the ongoing struggles between Louis and the other leading magnates in the kingdom, including his own uncle, Philip the Bold, Duke of Burgundy, and his cousin, Louis II, Duke of Anjou. Louis of Orléans may have also been trying to protect his wife, whom he seems to have adored, and protect his own political power. Valentina was hurt by her banishment, but she accepted it. Honestly, Paris wasn't really her style. She was granted one small favor. Her son was able to join her. Valentina was pregnant with Charles' younger brother, Philip, at the time of her exile. While being sent away from Paris, she wasn't being sent into poverty. Her husband would visit her regularly. In addition, he sent her, 
Loads of gifts. Oh, and he provided well for her financially. Louis paid Valentina 200 gold francs per month, and the king paid her 6,000 per year. Charles VI appears to have greatly missed his sister-in-law and wanted to make sure she was being provided for. Even though Charles and his mother had been sent away, his father still wanted the young man to look like him. It was a popular style in the day to dress children as miniatures of their parents, and Louis made sure that his son looked like him even if they were apart. In their defense, my daughter and I have matching swimsuits, and everyone tells us we look adorable at swim practice, and she loves it. Charles's brother, Philip, was born on either the 21st or the 24th of July, 1396. They would be close throughout their childhoods. Charles's next brother, John, would be born in June of 1399. Charles and John may not have been as close as Charles and Philip, but they were almost always together. All three brothers would spend a great deal of their lives apart, sadly. As should be obvious from these dates, Louis visited his family regularly. Valentina would give birth to her first daughter, Marie, in 1401. Sadly, Marie didn't live long. Her last child, Margaret, was born in December of 1406. Between the birth of her first daughter and her second daughter, Valentina welcomed her favorite child, Jean de Dumois, the bastard of Orléans, Louis's illegitimate son. Yes, I think he was her favorite. She actually regretted that he wasn't her child. Enid McLeod even shares that she was quoted saying, I have been robbed of him. Honestly, with all the poor treatment illegitimate children have gotten throughout history, it's good to see this family sorted it all out. And it would be nice for Louis in the long run. As you may remember, Dunois was a brilliant military commander and would do all he could to protect his older brother's rights and properties in later years. I will also be calling him the bastard throughout his brother's episodes. Not because I don't like him, I actually really do. He's amazing. But because that's how he signed all his letters, even after he was, spoilers, made a count. I do want you all to notice that Louis names two of his sons, John or Jean. It's kind of funny when you notice he didn't name any of his surviving sons Louis, like you had the name sitting there. In fairness, his first son to survive birth had been named Louis and had died at four, so he might have been particularly heartbroken by that name. In addition to the massive payments Valentina received from her husband and the regular shipments of clothing and supplies, Louis made sure that Valentina could easily care for the education of their children. One of her companions was the poet Eustace Duchamp, probably one of the most influential poets of his day. And by that, I mean, even if he only influenced one person, it was that influential. Hint, hint. Charles' governess was Jeanne de Ivril, and his schoolmaster was Nicolas Garbet. Valentina oversaw the education of all her children, including her illegitimate adoptive-ish son. And she didn't take this role lightly. You may remember my description of the Burgundian court as being of one of luxury. Well, the court of Orléans will one day soon be a court of learning and knowledge. Valentina was a lover of books and saw to it that her library was well appointed. This less-than-grand upbringing, which would have been very different from being raised in Paris, may have led to some of Charles's humbleness in later life. He also would end up lacking political guile, so it wasn't all good, but, you know, at least he wasn't raised in Paris. Charles's father had struggled to make a marriage match. Louis actually had two cancelled marriage negotiations before marrying Valentina. Charles would go through something similar. His parents' first attempt was for a daughter of Wenceslas of Bohemia, not the Wenceslas of song fame. Nothing came of this attempt. Instead, just like his parents, he was married to his own cousin. Yes, luckily, there was a lovely young French princess who was also a widow in need of a husband. Isabella of Valois, Dowager Queen of England, the oldest daughter of Charles VI, was available and would tie the Orléans family closer to the crown. There were just a few problems. They were related, just like everyone else. Oh, and Charles VI was, of course, Charles' godfather, which made the consanguinity a bit extra touchy. But the Pope was persuaded to grant dispensation. Isabella was the one person seemingly not convinced by the match. 
By the time arrangements were being made, she was almost 15 and had in many ways loved being the Queen of England. Richard II, remember, was very kind to the women in his life, including both of his wives. She'd loved the title and pomp that came with it. And being the wife of the son of a duke just wasn't a huge deal for her. This match, though, made a lot of sense, not just for the Orléans faction, but for the French crown as well. Due to the strength that the new Duke of Burgundy, John the Fearless, wields, he had been able to arrange for his daughter to marry Charles VI's oldest son and heir, Louis the Dauphin, and for his oldest son to marry Charles VI's fourth daughter, Michelle. Due to Charles VI's ongoing mental health issues, Louis was acting as his regent, as in Louis of Orléans, not his son Louis. But John the Fearless wanted any amount of power he could get. Louis, again of Orléans, had been spending more time around his sister-in-law. Again. You'll remember the accusations that they were having an affair. There are even further accusations that Louis of Orléans is the father of her seven younger children. Isabeau's support was critical for Louis. It allowed him to raise taxes on the people of France, and these taxes were harsh. And this will come into play soon. But back to Charles for a moment. On the 29th of July, 1406, he and Isabella married. He was 11 and probably happy to be doing his duty, though due to his age, the couple would need to wait at least two and a half years before consummating their union. His wife, on the other hand, was 16 and was only doing her duty. She actually wept openly at the altar. Remember, she was marrying down in her mind, from a king to the son of a duke, and her cousin to boot. I have a few comics about this level of consanguinity coming up. She couldn't have known how history would turn out. None of us can. She wouldn't know that her great-nephew, Charles VIII, would fail to produce male issue, or any surviving legitimate issue and that the child of her husband would actually become king. You'll notice I worded that sentence very carefully. That wasn't an accident, but I'll get to it after the biggest scandal in France since... Okay, well, the Hundred Years' War had been a bit exuberant in the scandal section, so prior to that, probably the biggest scandal since the Tour de Nel affair. This scandal occurred a little more than a year after the young couple married. The day before Charles's 13th birthday, the 23rd of November, 1407, his father Louis was in Paris, having dinner with Isabeau. This day actually happened to be the bastard of Orléans' fifth birthday. You'll remember Isabeau had just given birth to her final child, who may or may not have been Louis's child. This child sadly didn't live long after birth, and Isabeau and Charles VI lived in different palaces in Paris, one can hardly blame her. When he was unwell, he would throw plates at her. That evening, one of the king's servants, a man Louis should have been able to trust, came into the room where the friends were dining to inform the duke that his brother had called for him. Louis was nothing if not loyal to his brother. Honestly, they were close in spite of Charles VI's illness. Louis rushed towards his brother's residence. On his way, as you may remember, he was viciously attacked by men in the pay of John the Fearless. He and one of his esquires were killed, and Louis didn't travel alone. He had a rather large retinue, and these murderers got to him anyway. This was a well-planned assassination. Actually, the planning of the assassination isn't the most egregious thing about it. It's what the planner did around, before, and after. John the Fearless knew which day his plans would be carried out. He had invited Louis to join him for dinner the following Sunday. Yes, a Sunday he knew his cousin would not be alive to experience. John the Fearless, upon being told of his cousin's murder, joined his fellow princes, his uncles, John of Berry and Louis of Bourbon, and his cousin, Louis of Anjou, at Hotel d'Anjou, to sort out what had happened. They were joined by Guillaume de Thionville, the provost of Paris. They ordered him to seal the city gates and to gather evidence and report back to them. So yes, John the Fearless acted as though he had no clue what had just happened to his cousin other than him being dead. Further, the next day, he even helped carry the body to burial along with the other princes. Charles VI was so unwell that he was unable to attend his brother's quickly arranged funeral. 
John the Fearless was vocal with his lamentations about the murder of Louis. The next day, though, the jig was up. Tinonville had investigated the scene of the crime and interviewed witnesses in an investigation that wouldn't look unfamiliar to modern minds, you know, minus forensics. And he was confident he knew who ordered the crime. When counsel met the next day, Tinonville requested the princes allow him to search their residences. Barry, Anjou, and Bourbon accepted. John the Fearless, though, got up and asked Barry and Anjou to join him in the next room. Had Tionville searched John's residence, he likely wouldn't have made it out alive, since the assassins were hiding there. Once John the Fearless's uncle and cousin had joined him in the next room, he informed them that he had planned the killing of Louis. He expressed no remorse. The two senior princes were so shocked that they allowed John to leave and return to his residence. And this was their great mistake. They informed counsel that they would meet the next day. And John showed up for this meeting. I should mention he's a bit audacious. His uncle refused him entry since they were chatting about his crime. John, seeing that this might go poorly for him, fled Paris, along with his assassins. He went to his property in Amiens to secure his holdings. While securing his holdings, he took legal and spiritual advice, and that's not a bad idea. And as we know, he will be able to avoid, at least temporarily, the legal blame for this murder. What was Charles doing during this two-day period? You know, during his birthday? Well, he likely had no idea what had happened until at least the afternoon of his 13th birthday. It would have taken that long for a normal speed horse to reach him if it had been dispatched immediately. His mother, practical woman that she was, didn't just wait for things to happen. She sent Charles, his brother Philip, his sister Margaret, and likely the bastard of Orléans to Blois for their protection. It was a well-fortified city and would become Charles's favorite in later life. She, on the other hand, kept her youngest son John, who was only seven, and her daughter-in-law with her at Chateau Terry. Keeping her daughter-in-law with her was a brilliant stroke. She was now the princess's protector, and no one would risk hurting Isabella. While Valentina was planning her next move, the money men in Paris were appropriating her son's property. Yes, not even days after Louis's death, they had taken back property that he had given to his daughter-in-law, you know, the king's oldest daughter, and property he had given Valentina. They seemed to have forgotten to read his will and decided that since the king needed funds, they could just take them from his dead brother since the king had given it to his brother in the first place. Valentina would need to risk returning to Paris to present her case to counsel and to ask for justice. She arrived in the city on the 10th of December. Thankfully, at the time of her arrival, Charles VI was in a fit state and able to meet with her. He ordered that counsel would meet on the 15th to discuss this case. The king asked his uncles Barry and Bourbon to visit John at Amiens to ask the duke to request forgiveness. Bourbon declined this mission. Remember, he has no relation to John the Fearless, and he never wanted to see his nephew's killer again. Instead, Anjou joined Barry. John the Fearless told them to take a hike. As I mentioned, John the Fearless had sought legal advice for his crime, and these knowledgeable scholars and churchmen had helped him devise the defense I mentioned in an earlier episode, tyrannicide, the lawful killing of a tyrant. John was claiming that Louis had been acting as such and that John should be thanked. Unlike a certain group of Roman senators who used the same argument in 44 BCE, this argument would end up working out for John, at least for a while. He told his uncle and cousin that he would return to Paris to plea his legal case, even though they informed him that he was not to return. When Barry and Anjou returned to Paris to inform the king and Valentina of what John had shared with them, Valentina did the only rational thing and fled the city. She was deeply aware of the risk that John posed to her family. She wasn't running scared, though. She was planning. She returned to Orléans to strengthen its defenses, and she sold her own jewelry and plate to pay off her husband's debts. She renewed her family alliance with Brittany, and she brought young Charles into these preparations. She wasn't going to leave her son defenseless, and in this, Charles was lucky. 
His mother had seen to his education and upbringing, and now she was seeing to his life. As expected, on the 28th of February, 1408, John the Fearless returned to Paris with his rather large retinue, really a mini army. Charles VI was unwell, and Isabeau was in charge. Well, as in charge as she could be. She couldn't stop John from entering the city without an all-out war, and it wasn't the right time for a civil war. Foreshadowing. Isabeau would be battling with the people of Paris if she had tried. For the moment, John the Fearless was popular with the Parisians because he had framed himself as the savior of the people, protecting them from the harsh taxes Louis of Orléans had put them under. Now, I should mention that John was receiving a huge pension from the French crown. So while Louis may have been overtaxing them, John had been benefiting from it. John the Fearless was, of course, there to defend himself against the charge of murdering Louis of Orléans. Burgundy's case would be presented before Parliament, various members of the university, and the leading noblemen. Bourbon, who had promised he would never set eyes on John the Fearless again, skipped the event, along with his son, Clermont. I have forgotten to make this clear, but Bourbon is the maternal uncle of Louis of Orléans and Charles VI of France, and the great uncle of Charles, our subject. Interestingly, his son, Clermont, had been close to John when he was younger, but had solidly moved to the Orleanist camp since. John the Fearless came in and sat next to Brittany, whom you'll remember had just signed a treaty with Charles. His disdain for John was obvious to all present. It's actually recorded in the meeting notes. At this meeting, held on the 8th of March, 1408, John's fearless advocate presented his defense to counsel. Instead of admitting any wrongdoing, John's advocate used his four-hour-long speech to accuse Louis of a few things, including trying to poison his own brother, you know, the king, idolatry, sorcery, and being lustful. We're pretty confident the final one is true, but the others were just mean, and the first was definitely untrue. After this presentation, the case was discussed. Despite many Orleanist supporters being present, John was... Well, not charged with anything. Queen Isabeau actually fled Paris for Melun after hearing the full defense. She took the Dauphin and the Daphne with her. Barry Anjou Brittany, Louis of Bavaria, who's Isabeau's brother, and Charles d'Albray, the constable of France, joined her. Charles probably would have gone too if he hadn't already been in his own holding south of the Loire and relatively safe. While Isabeau was running for the hills, John the Fearless managed to gain an audience with the king. He then convinced the king that Louis had been planning to kill him. While Charles was having a lucid moment, he wasn't well. He'd been having mental health episodes for more than 10 years at this point. John then begged only the king for forgiveness and then managed to score a signed and sealed letter from the king, reinstating him into the royal fold. Isabeau, learning of this, reached out to Valentina because, well, John had shown himself to be their common enemy. She invited Valentina to return to Paris when she herself went back. Isabeau arrived back in Paris on the 26th of August, and Valentina arrived on the 28th. She brought Princess Isabella with her, and had plans for Charles to follow soon after. With Isabeau and Valentina back in Paris and in control of Charles VI, a hearing for John the Fearless was set for the 11th of September. Once this hearing date had been set, Valentina called for Charles, and he arrived on the 9th. While John had been making his case, young Charles had been helping his mother fortify their holdings. When Charles arrived, he met with the Queen and his cousin, the Dauphin Louis. Bourbon also returned to Paris at this time since John the Fearless had left around the same time the royal ladies arrived. On the 11th of September, as scheduled, Valentina's response was presented by Circe, the abbot of saint friacre His response was met with resounding approval. He emphasized that justice had not been served. Next, Guillaume Cousiant, the Chancellor of Orléans, who will be a lifelong supporter of Charles, spoke to what Valentina and her family's demands for punishment were. This list of demands includes John returning to Paris and admitting fault while begging for a pardon, kissing the earth at the site of the crime, erecting a cross there, building a religious house at the property the murderers had stayed in, 
building further chapels in Rome and Jerusalem. A public confession. Oh, and while this was going on, he needed to stay in prison until these things were done. And then he needed to be banished once everything was complete. Valentina wasn't a stupid woman. She didn't expect all of these wishes to happen. She was hoping that John would be forced to follow through on a few of these demands, especially the begging for forgiveness bit. She knew there was no way he'd have to suffer all of them. The king did revoke the letter of reinstatement he had given John, but that's where he stopped for the moment. While Charles was in Paris, he paid homage to his uncle slash godfather slash father-in-law, as should be expected now that he was almost 14, and 14 being of age. After this, he and his wife and mother returned to Blois. Charles VI sent ambassadors to recall John the Fearless. While Charles and his mother had been fighting their battle in Paris, John had been fighting literal battles of his own in Burgundy. He had been dealing with local uprisings and winning. These wins made him scary to the Parisian magnates. Those that supported Charles previously were starting to think they should keep their mouths shut. John marched on Paris with a proper army. Isabeau requested that the princes of the blood stay to face him, but they decided they were not up for meeting John. Instead, the queen, along with the rest of the royal family, Anjou, Barry, Brittany, Bourbon, and his son Clermont and Alençon left for Tua in November. Charles's mother had been devastated with the death of her husband, and the lack of justice for him further broke her heart. Valentina died on the 4th of December, 1408, continuing a string of Orléans dying on their children's birthday. The day she died was her youngest child's second birthday. Valentina herself was only 37. There isn't a recorded cause of death, but as Enid MacLeod expresses, her contemporaries who said that the bitterness of her grief and her despair had brought on an incurable languor for which she died. In short, her supporters thought she died of a broken heart. John the Fearless was overjoyed at her death because he wasn't a nice guy. Charles was barely 14 at the time of his mother's death, and things could have gone horribly wrong for him at this point. He was now the leader of his faction. Little aside here, since Charles had turned 14, he and his wife did their, um, duty and consummated their marriage. Isabella was 17, so thankfully not a shockingly young bride. And based on what happened about 10 months later, they fell pregnant not long after this. Charles VI wanted there to be peace in his kingdom, and his method will sound familiar to those who have listened to Richard III, Duke of York's episodes. His grandson, Henry VI, would become a regular practitioner of this same method. Charles VI decided a meeting needed to happen. He scheduled it for the 9th of March, 1409. Those invited included Charles, his brothers, John and Philip, Charles d'Albray, and John the Fearless. Charles brought this group together to make peace. To make this happen, he was going to tell his nephews that they were at peace with John. Yes, all the guests showed. John brought along 600 attendants to Charles's 50. When John the Fearless's advocate spoke, John showed no remorse, no guilt. Instead, his advocate assured the king that he just wanted peace and for the king to not be upset. The king agreed since peace was the thing he wanted. Charles VI then ordered Charles, Philip, and John, Louis of Orléans' sons, to approach. Let me remind you that Charles was only 14, Philip was 13, and John wasn't even 10. At first, John the Fearless' spokesman asked the boys if they could be friends again with their cousin. The boys stood there silent. Then John himself asked the boys if they could be friends, and again the boys just stared. Finally, the king spoke. Quick note, it's not a mistake that he refers to Charles as his son. He was his godson. Quote, My very dear son, and you, my very dear nephews, approve and accept what we have done and what has been put before you, and forgive him everything. End quote. Just in case you forgot, John the Fearless arranged the murder of the king's own beloved brother. Charles somehow managed to respond with, quote, my very dear Lord, I obey your order, I consent, I approve all that you have done, and I forgive him everything. End quote. All swore on a cross to be loyal, 
Now, much like the later Peace Day Parade under Henry VI of England, this was a farce. No one there, save the king and John, show any signs of thinking this oath was real, at least when you look at their actions in the coming years. John the Fearless even offered one of his daughters to Philip, Charles's younger brother, and as Enid MacLeod put it, quote, a promise that, as the boy grew older, he managed to evade, end quote. With this peace, Charles VI and his court returned to Paris. He did get to say goodbye to his daughter, who had come with her husband and brothers-in-law. It's likely the king and queen were pleased that their oldest daughter was pregnant. It's lucky they got to say goodbye. Charles, Isabella, Philip, and John, along with their retainers, returned to Blois. On the 13th of September, 1409, Isabella gave birth to her only child, a daughter named Joan. Sadly, as was all too common in this time, Isabella died not long after the birth of her daughter. She was only 19. Yet again, I am forever grateful to live in the time of modern medicine where my chance of death in childbirth isn't greater than 4% throughout my lifetime versus the current rate in the U.S. of 0.019% which is actually sadly pretty poor compared to the rest of the OECD. Like Australia's is less than a third of that. While Isabella had cried on her wedding day, things had changed since then, and the young couple had grown to care for each other. Charles was heartbroken by his wife's death. Since his mother's death, he and Isabella had been looking after his three younger brothers, including his half-brother and his infant sister. With his wife's death, he was now a single teen parent of five children. Thankfully, he was a wealthy single parent. Sadly, he was also a single teen parent who needed to literally protect his family. Despite not being pleased with the outcome of his meeting with John the Fearless and the king, Charles stayed calm for the time being. He knew he had publicly sworn not to go after John, and he needed to look after his rather large family. And for now, that's all he did. A few years earlier, not long after having weaseled his way out of a murder charge, John the Fearless had Guillaume de Thionville replaced as the provost of Paris with his own man, Pierre de Essart. If you're curious, provost of Paris is an appointed role that would feel most similar to a senior court justice come detective. Someone who could investigate crime, present evidence, and then call for justice. He also could collect taxes. It was a lucrative and powerful role, as you can guess. This, of course, meant that John the Fearless was in control of this powerful role, since Essart was his man. Essart, in this role, arrested John de Montague, Charles VI's Grand Master of the Household, in October of 1409. Montague's role really was as fancy as it sounds. He was the guy in charge of the king's household. Montague, a favorite of the king, was tortured and confessed. To what, you ask? Aiding Louis of Orléans in exerting evil influence over the king. And why didn't the king step in? This was one of his favorites. Well, because he was having a mental incident. Less than two weeks after his arrest, on the 17th of October 1409, Montague was executed. Let me emphasize that everyone knew this arrest and execution was John the Fearless's doing and politically motivated. Charles had done nothing since the meeting in March that year, at least in an offensive way. But this blatant act of aggression slapped some sense into him. John the Fearless had been forgiven and still had power and was not happy. It wasn't enough. If Charles didn't do something soon, John would come after him. Charles, along with his brothers, began gathering troops and sent messages to his ally. He also let the queen, Isabeau, know what he was doing. As part of his preparations, he signed a military alliance with Count Bernard of Armagnac. He promised, in language expected in the day, that he would serve Armagnac against all save the king, queen, and Dauphin. You may have caught that name, Armagnac. This is the foundation of the Armagnac-Burgundian Civil War. With that exciting note, I will pause until next week. This will be a huge series, as I mentioned at the start, and I don't want these to get too long. I will see you next week. Thank you for listening to Past. I can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at PastPod. That's P-A-S-S-E-D-P-O-D. Please feel free to email me at pastpod at gmail.com. I have a Patreon that can be found at patreon.com 
backslash pastpod.